right subscribers. Yeah, I'm thankful that I've gotten a few testimonies, right? I've gotten confirmation from my pastor, you know, that this is what I should be doing. I've had testimonies from different people who have watched these videos at different times, right? The ones I did a few years ago and the ones I'm doing recently. I'm thankful for the support. I'm thankful for somebody being, you know, willing enough to watch through the whole video. You know, I know I'm not that good yet. I think the, the message is the, the main part, right? But as far as being on camera, that this is this is all kind of new to me. So I'm thankful that you guys are bearing with me. You're giving me a chance and you're encouraging me. I'm thankful. I'm very thankful for that. Um, <clears throat> today I want to talk about a story out of the book of Daniel, right? I'm not going to go through the whole story, just the part that we need. So this message is about resolve, right? If you read, if not read, I mean, number one, if you read your Bible, yes, but if you have paid attention to any of the videos I previously have recorded, then you know that we've been talking about faith. We've been talking about how to increase your faith and how to walk in purpose, right? One thing I didn't want to go into because it was kind of, it was a segment of the message that I was currently recording, right? And it's resolve, right? How do you become resolved? Because we get attacked. Even I'm getting attacked, you know, maybe not right at this moment, but as I was preparing this, I was getting attacked the whole time. The, the enemy, the devil that we know, he, do, he doesn't want us to walk in purpose. He doesn't want us to help others. He doesn't want us to expose his secrets. He definitely doesn't want us to give the confidence that we've gained through faith to other people, right? Because we're all at different levels, different stages. Now, if I could have had someone to preach this message to me, and I'm not going to do many, much preaching as far as yelling and screaming, but I'm going to do some, a little bit of preaching, a little bit of teaching, right? Because I understand that preaching is, is the part of it where it's like the kingdom of God is near, right? That's just speaking the word, but teaching is to explain the word. I want to do both. I don't want you to be ill-equipped. If you're watching my videos, I want you to be perfectly equipped to understand what I'm trying to tell you. So, here we go. We're going to start off with Daniel chapter 1 verse 7. And I have to, you know, put a little disclaimer here so you will know. All scriptures that's used in this specific story is from the New International Version of the Bible, right? Because the King James, is that, that language is a little bit rough right now. And the Bible I've already ordered, the New King James, it hasn't come yet. So I like some of the, some of the translations in this one. So we're going to use every scripture from the New International Version. Okay, so Daniel chapter 1, verse 7. To them... Okay, so I, let me tell you a backstory before I get into that scripture. So the backstory is, in the book of Jeremiah, the prophet Jeremiah received the word from the Lord that about Israel and that they were turning away and they were being adult, adulterous, right? Fornicating with other gods. They were following after other gods that's not the God who chose us, right? And, you know, many cultures have different gods. So when you get conquered by a nation, you usually assimilate into that culture and you follow their gods and you follow their customs. But as we know, God is not a fan of those kind of things. Like, God is a jealous God, which I have that scripture coming up a little bit a little bit later. But um, the point of this is that Jeremiah the prophet warned Israel to turn away from their sin and to follow God again. We did not. We did not follow him. He did what he said he was going to do. He delivered us into bondage once more to teach us that he is the only God that can save us. But he's also the God who can get you thrown into slavery. He can also the God that can take you out of slavery. He can rise up a new king, such as King David or King Saul or King Solomon, or he can tear down a king, such as King David, King Saul, or King Solomon. Everything happens on God's time. But when we get high and mighty, when we get prideful and think that we can do it on our own, that's not going to work because God is everlasting. He knows every intent of our heart, right? The way to get things from God is to have a pure heart before him. The minute we get out of our, out of our lane, out of our purpose, things start to go awry. Like I said, we're getting attacked constantly, right? So the prophet Jeremiah told Israel to do a certain thing. They didn't do it. And this is how we end up in this story where in the book of Daniel, Israel has been taken over, right? Jerusalem has been ransacked by the Babylonians. The temple has been destroyed. So we can no longer worship God. We're in a foreign land. And they are now assimilating into a new Babylonian culture, which is not our own, right? And I, just in case you're wondering, Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, King Nebuchadnezzar, this is the same Babylon that if you read Genesis, I believe, chapter 6, I don't know if that's exactly true, but it's early in Genesis, where it's the Tower, the tower of Babel, where the, the humans were all speaking one language, they were all one race of people, right? This was after the days of Noah, they were all one race of people, they all spoke one language, 
they were trying to get to heaven without the work of God. So instead of entreating God and seeking God's will for their lives, they tried to become God and get to heaven without using God. And God came down to see what the humans were doing. He saw that they were trying to get to heaven without him. He crushed the tower. And then he scrambled all of the languages. So everybody had a different language, right? He spread the humans around to different regions. And that's how we have all these different regions. People look different. People's skin color looks different. Their genes are different because God spread them out so that we could not believe that achieve, the human achievements were done without God, right? He doesn't like stuff like that because God is glorious. He is perfect and everything he wants is righteous, right? But you cannot do those things without God. We need God's help with everything. He knows this because he knows that we have an enemy always attacking, always ready to attack us, right? So, here we go with Daniel chapter 1 verse 7. To them, the chief of the eunuchs gave names, right? Because when Babylon attacked them and they took them over, you know, when you're a king, usually, especially in the Bible days, they want to grab people who are leaders in the Jerusalem, in, um, in the Jewish faith. They want to grab leaders, right? People that the people respect. So if we, if we can turn these guys, then all of them will bow down, right? That's really their, their purpose. I mean, it's also that they want to use, right? So they want to use the gifts that God has given you. If you were still in Jerusalem, you would be using those gifts to serve God's purpose. But since you have been conquered, King Nebuchadnezzar would like you to use those gifts that God gave you for his purposes, right? So the chief of the eunuchs gave names, and the eunuchs served the Babylonian court. So the chief eunuch gave them names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar to Hananiah Shadrach to Mishael Meshach and to Azariah Abednego. Now we're not going to talk about Daniel anymore after this. But we'll go we'll come back to Daniel maybe tomorrow. I'm thinking about doing a series on resolve because there's there's many, many angles I can take with this resolve series as far as the faith is concerned, right? So we're starting with Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. Okay, so he had a dream, right? You know how God speaks to us through different ways, right? We already talked about this. God spoke through Nebuchadnezzar spoke to Nebuchadnezzar through a dream, but because he's not in God's presence, nor is he one of God's chosen people, he couldn't understand or interpret the dream, right? And we know this happened previously in the Bible with Joseph when he went to Egypt, and the Pharaoh had a dream, a few dreams, right? I think the chief baker had a dream, and the, it was a chief baker and the chief butler had a dream, two different dreams, and the Pharaoh had a dream. And the only way they could be interpreted was because of Joseph, right, the guy who's chosen by God because even in a foreign land if you're chosen by God God will still increase your strength he will make sure that you have favor with men and with God so you have favor with God because you're in his presence and because he chose you but you also have favor with men because his spirit is flowing through you right the Bible tells us that God will make even our enemies to be at peace with us right so Nebuchadnezzar had a dream he cannot interpret it right he, he summons all of his magicians, his astrologers, his sorcerers, and none of them could interpret the dream. But Daniel, you know, Daniel prayed to God. He asked the king, can I pray to God and I'll come back in a certain amount of time and I'll tell you the inter interpretation because my God can do such a thing. So Daniel prayed to God. God gave him the interpretation. And then I'm not going to tell you the exact interpretation because it's about 10 verses of a scripture, but I'll just give you the gist of it, right? The gist of it is that he was telling Nebuchadnezzar that the reason why your kingdom is so bountiful and plentiful and you've conquered so many lands and, and countries and kings is because God has empowered you. God chose him, right? God chose him from a young age to be the conqueror that sent Israel into bondage, right? This was uh, Everything that happens in this world is part of a plan, right? But you have to have faith to receive that. You have to understand that. When you see things happening that doesn't seem like they make sense, it's by faith. You have to receive it. Just like we're crazy by thinking that because a man died on the cross, that means we're saved from hellfire. I can tell you that it's true, but I can't explain it to you because your faith is not increased, right? Once your faith starts increasing, you will hear God speak to you specifically. and You will know that what you're doing is the right thing, but you have to take a step first, right? That's why it's, it's called walking by faith and not by sight. So... Pretty much the gist of the dream is that Nebuchadnezzar, he, he was telling Nebuchadnezzar that God rises up kings and empires and he tears them down, right? Because God will bring, at this specific time, Nebuchadnezzar was the empire that was ruling the world, the Babylonian empire. But we know that it become the 
I believe the Israelites was captured by Egypt early on in the Bible, right? So it was the Egyptian Empire. It became the Assyrian Empire, Assyria. Then it became the Babylonian Empire. Then it went on to... Who came after the Babylonians? I can't remember, but there was someone in between. No, the Persian Empire. So it was the Babylonian Empire, the Persian Empire, and then it became the Roman Empire, which is when Jesus Christ came back. That was the empire that was ruling the world at that time. Right? So... After he made this dream, he told him the interpretation of the dream. He told him he was chosen by God and that God chose him to do such and such and such, right? This made Nebuchadnezzar prideful, right? So now we're going to go scroll down to Daniel chapter 3, verses 1. And um, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold, whose height was 60 cubits and its width was 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. So what this is saying is that, like I told you, after that dream, it made um, Nebuchadnezzar become prideful. And as he became prideful, I guess he got outside of himself, right? He started doing things that were not necessarily God-like. Even though he knew that he was chosen by God, he knew that God wanted him to take care of his chosen people, right? God didn't put, God would never put his chosen people in someone's hand that he know will kill them or he know will destroy them. Because God is in control of all situations. He knows our hearts, right? The Bible tells us that man looks at the outward appearance, but God himself looks at the heart. And this is why somebody who you think is not as qualified as you may have jumped the line, right? It's because of their heart. It's not because of what they look like or who they know or what connections, because God qualifies people. He doesn't choose qualified people. He doesn't choose the people with the most degrees. He chooses the people with no degrees because he wants to show you that I am God. I can choose the foolish things to confound the wise. That's an actual Bible scripture, right? So, okay, he, he makes a golden statue, right? So what is the purpose of this golden statue? Well, I'll let you know. So we're going down to verses 5 through 7. We're still in Daniel chapter 3. And I'm going to read these scriptures out to you. As soon as you hear, this is this is um, Nebuchadnezzar talking to all of the nations that he's conquered because he has a, a vast empire of different people with different languages, right? So he's trying to impose a way of life on them. And this is to bow down to his golden statue. The golden statue is him. He made a golden statue of himself. And I told you the measurement, 60 cubits height and 6 cubits wide. So that's a statue of him. He wants to be worshipped like a god. So picture that. This is an idol before God, right? So verses 5 through 7. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Basically, what he's saying is that once you hear, it's like, how could I compare this? I'm not sure if there's any real, real world example that I can pull from, but picture a trumpet being blown. Like, right, we know the kingdom of heaven, they love trumpets. Like, that's a signifying of, 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 of war. When you hear a trumpet from heaven, that means war is coming, right? So signify, that just think of a horn being played. Some horn sound, and this is when you're supposed to bow down to King Nebuchadnezzar, right? Because he wants to be praised like a god. He he heard the dream, and now he's become prideful. Now he thinks that this is what he deserved. This is his position in life, right? So we're going to continue reading. Whoever does not fall down in worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, and all kinds of music, all the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So this is letting you know that all of the conquered people believe the same thing. All of them were living in fear. All of them believe that it's either bow down to what he said or die. None of them had faith in God. And like we know, the J Jerusalem, the Jewish people, they were the ones who worshipped the true God. But all of these other nations that got conquered, they had gods of their own. But they didn't have, none of them had confidence in their God. Even the Jewish people didn't have confidence in God himself. The God that we serve, they had no confidence in him. They were so scared, they all bowed down to what the enemy had said. And allowed an image, right, to frighten them. Allowed um, uh, the possible outcome of the future, right? Fear, they had a spirit of fear. But we know in, I believe that's in 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7. It says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So if anything is striking inside your mind or things are happening that's giving you fear, it's not of God. God is not a man of fear, right? God is not a God of fear. The only thing that God says about fear, considering himself, is that he says that 
the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So it's wise to fear God because God is the only one that can either let you into heaven or send you to hell. It's wise to fear God, but God doesn't want you to stay at that level. Fearing God is what leads us to repentance. And after we get repented, we get right with God. So now he's, he calls you a son or daughter. And this is why you seek his face and we get to call him father. So you don't pray and just say, God, please this and God, please that. You ask him father because now I know you. You are my son. You are my chosen daughter. Same thing Jesus prayed on the cross is the same thing you can pray. Father, father, father. He is now your father once you get saved, once you receive salvation. And that's all by faith, right? So we're going to... We're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 5, right? We're going way back to the old, like way early in the Old Testament, right? Because we know in the Ten Commandments, God gave a specific commandment about how to serve God and why you shouldn't serve other gods and what you should do, right? So I'm going to read it to you. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 7 through 9. You shall have no other gods before me, meaning God, I am, the God that we worship, Yeshua, you shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. So off the rip, because King Nebuchadnezzar has made a golden image of himself, that's already a, a, a broken commandment for the, for, the, for the Israelites, right? That's already something that they shouldn't even be worshiping. But because of fear, they're, they're disobeying the commandments that God has given them. And we know back in, I believe, the book of Exodus, when Moses first rescued them from Egypt, Egypt represented sin, right? It, it represented the bondage, the slavery they, that they were under. They, they had also went through this before. They had been assimilated into the Egyptian culture and started worshiping the Egyptian gods, right? But when God had rescued them and they were out in the wilderness, he promised them that they would go to the promised land. But they kept complaining over and over and over. And at one point, because they didn't want to do what God asked them to do, they didn't want to serve God that, they didn't want to serve the God that chose them, they want to go back to Egypt and serve those false gods that had them enslaved. God, you know, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and they had built up a golden calf. Which a golden calf is like a, it's like pretty much a, a statue of a cow, you know, enshrined in gold. And they decide to worship that. A lifeless God versus a God that's speaking directly to them from the skies. Who's making thunder happen, who's making lightning happen, who put Ten Commandments on stone. They saw all of these miracles. God is the same God who... He told Moses to hit the rock and it, it poured out water in the middle of a desert. It poured out water. And I can go into these scriptures a little bit later, but there was also God himself. When it was nighttime, he would turn into a pillar. Of, he would appear as a pillar of fire so he can light the way so they can travel at night through the wilderness. And then when it was daytime, he appeared as a pillar of a cloud. So this is how they got through the wilderness, right? If it's one day, they will follow that cloud. And they will sit under the cloud, sit under God's protection. That's just saying you're under God's protection. You're under his shadow. So that he can, everything that's within his realm, you know what I'm saying? Everything within, within that realm, he can control and he is in control of. Because man still has their own decisions, right? We still have free will. We got free will in the garden. So no matter how much, how much God or how much faith you have, man still has free will. This is why we have to seek God's will for our life and stay in his presence. We can't never get high and mighty and think that we don't need God because that's when things go wrong. There will always be humans who do things outside of what God wants them to do. That's why you have to have God in your life because he will give you discernment. He will give you power. He will give you the ability to cast out demons from other people to set them free. He will give you the ability to preach the gospel, to have salvation. And much more than preaching the gospel is preaching the kingdom, right? We pre we're supposed to be preaching the kingdom, which is the, the kingdom's way of doing things. This is part of the kingdom's way of doing things. When your faith gets tested, you must have resolve. You can't be weak. You can't be soft. You can't be brittle. You can't be easily broken. That's mean you got to see God's face often, early and often, because he will, every piece of fear, he will drive it out. Every piece of hatred, every piece of envy, every piece of jealousy, anything that's not of God, that's of this earth, he will drive it out. And you will have a complete peace, and you will know what God has for you. But uh, let, me, let me continue reading that, right? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. Right? God is a jealous guy. Right? It's like a, like a jealous girlfriend. Right? It's crazy, right? If you, well, what does the Bible tell you about a jealous girlfriend? Hell has no fury like a woman scorned. 
You ain't never seen fear until you've seen God. Trust me. If the Holy Spirit come upon you and he asks you to do something, and you start doing, committing sins and doing things you shouldn't be doing, he get angry. I'm telling you, I'm, from personal experience, he will yell right in your ear. God don't want to yell. He doesn't like to yell. But the problem is, when we sin, we draw ourselves away from God, right? Because when, when, you're, when you're living a clean and holy and pure life, you're close to God. He can whisper directly into your ear. He feels like you're his friend, you're his son, right? He believes you, he has faith in you, and he will do everything you ask him to do within the purpose that he has set for your life. But if you start to sin, you drift away from God. It's the same thing about the Garden of Eden. The reason why when they ate the apple, God had to send them to earth is because God cannot dwell with sin. God cannot live inside of you and guide your actions, guide your thoughts, guide the intents of your heart if you're living in sin. Because he cannot dwell with sin. This is why when the devil rebelled in heaven, he, got, he had to be sent down to earth. And that's how the Garden of Eden and all the mistakes that happened afterwards happened. Because of the devil. He was the first sinner in heaven. But sin cannot dwell with God, so he had to be sent down here. And that pretty much said everything on a certain course of action. Right? So we all we know that God doesn't want us to worship any other gods before him. He doesn't want us to make any image of anything in the heavens, anything on earth, or anything in the waters below. So Nebuchadnezzar is literally commanding them to break the commandment that God has given them. Right? So there should only be one option. To live by faith and do what God asks you to do. Pray about everything. Live by faith and let God do what he asked. Let God do what he said he's going to do. He said he will be with us. He will protect us. He shall never leave us nor forsake us. But everybody has forgotten about this. Right? I told you that everyone has bowed down to this statue. Everybody is worshiping what Nebuchadnezzar has told them to worship. Right? They're all bowing down. So, I got a few points. Okay, so all of Israel bowed down with all of the other conquered nations. So, all of Israel, every single person in Israel outside of these three boys who I previously told you about, their names are Babylonian names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had, they had other names in the Hebrew language, but that's what their new names as far as the assimilation to this new culture. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down. Since they refused to bow down, they were summoned before the king after a few Babylonian officials noticed that they were resistant to the new culture, to the new ruling of the king. Right? So, they were they were talking to King Nebuchadnezzar. I wish I would have wrote that scripture down. Somehow I, I, I forgot about that one, but King Nebuchadnezzar asked them why they're not bowing down. And they pretty much told him that we shall not defend ourselves before you in this matter, right? We shall not defend ourselves, like, explain to you, argue with you, or quarrel with you. God said one thing, you said another. We're going to do what God say. Pretty much, this was the stance that they were taking. And this is why I have this message built on resolve, because it takes a certain amount of resolve to know that if you don't bow down to this man's statue, you will be thrown into the flames, right? That's like going to hell. You're going to be thrown into the flames, the flames of life, and be burnt up in an instant, and it gets worse from there, right? So we'll keep talking. Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 through 19. Once they said, we will not answer, we will not defend ourselves before you in this matter, King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar got furious, right? So the Bible says that Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. So it's already a hot flame. It's already a furnace that's going to burn up anybody who gets in contact with it. But because he was so angry at their dismissal of his so-called commandments, right? What happened is he turned the fire up seven times hotter. So he called up a few of his Babylonian, um, what do you call it, uh, soldiers, right? Elite soldiers, like so-called one of his elite soldiers, the strongest men in his army. He called about three or four of them. They tied up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they threw him into the fire. That's seven times hotter than usual. And the Bible tells us that the fire was so hot that the people that were thrown in, they fell down. Number one, they, they, they were thrown because they were tied up. I'm, tell, I'm thinking hands and feet were all tied because they fell down. When they got in the fire, they fell into the fire. They weren't thrown on top, on you know, standing straight up. They were thrown in and they fell into the fire. But the people that threw them into the fire, as soon as they came in contact, they instantly burned up. That's how hot the fire was. The people who threw them in the fire were instantly burned up. So, we're going to go down to Daniel chapter 3, verses 22 to 25. The king's command was so urgent 
and the furnace was the furnace was so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the three Hebrew men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his end. Let me let me make sure I emphasize that right. They fell into the fire because what I tell you next will surprise you. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three Hebrew men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, your majesty. And he said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. So this is letting you know right now that something is going awry that Nebuchadnezzar didn't notice, that he didn't expect, right? He said, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth one looks like a son of God. So now this is confirming that even when you're in a hard situation,